I think I'll just kick it off and get this get this going. So hello to everyone who is joining on Zoom and hello to everyone at the Society for Ethical Culture on the Upper West Side. My name is Malia. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a member of our chapter's food committee. And we chose urban agriculture as our topic this month because it's an important strategy for climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. And there are a wide range of agricultural activities that take place in our city, from backyard gardens to rooftop greenhouses and more. And they provide countless benefits like expanding access to healthy food, building strong community networks, and improving environmental conditions in our neighborhoods. So this evening, we are going to hear from special guests from Queens Botanical Garden. And because you can't have plant life without pollinators, we're also going to hear from representatives of Island Bee Project. So after we learn a little more about what it is that they do, um, we will open it up to questions from the group. And, you know, hopefully we will gain a whole lot of knowledge from tonight's meeting. And thank you again, everyone, for attending. So to start, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Karen Guzman. Karen is the farm manager at the Queens Botanical Garden. She obtained a bachelor's from Hunter College focusing on environmental science and received a horticulture certificate from the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. She's worked on urban farms all over the city such as Grow NYC's Teaching Garden, the Queens County Farm Museum, and was on the design and build team for Brooklyn Grange and has a passion rooted in urban agriculture. So is a perfect speaker tonight um, and loves teaching people how to use their limited space in an urban environment to grow their own food and grow it in a sustainable way. So Karen, thank you so much for being here. I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Um, nice to see you all and those that are showing your screen. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So I have a PowerPoint presentation. All right. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Guzman, and I'm the farm manager. Um, I'm happy to be contributing to today's topic on urban agriculture and climate change adaption. Um, as we know, it's an incredibly important topic. So I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the farm, um, our agricultural practices, and our work at the Queens Botanical Garden, and how we play a role within our community. So the Queens Botanical Garden prides itself as being the place where people, plants, and cultures meet. That's our tagline. Um, we're located within the most ethnically diverse borough in the world. Um, it's fittingly called the world's borough. We aim to reflect that title not only within the Botanical Garden, but also within the urban farm located on site. We grow a variety of fruits, vegetables, and cut flowers on our one acre farm. Um, which serves as a space for production, but also as a space for the community to gather through a variety of ways. And at the center of everything that we do is education. Um, the produce and flowers that we harvest get donated to a story of values. They're a Queens based food pantry. And we also stock up two local community fridges, one in Elmhurst and the other one in Jackson Heights that are featured in the pictures below. Um, alongside that heart-shaped pepper that I harvested this season and I've been obsessed with it since. 
Um, our fridge donations would happen every Tuesday afternoon and people from the community would already be in wait to be able to take some fresh produce home. This season we've donated so far over 7,000 pounds of food and our weekly donations are still ongoing. So delving a bit into our practices, we use only organic practices, specifically focusing on low-till agriculture and a closed loop system. We are very lucky because we have the New York City compost project here on site at the Botanical Garden. So any agricultural waste that gets, um, any agricultural waste gets processed here. And then we use the finished compost back on the farm demonstrating that closed loop system, which aims to minimize waste through every step of the way. We also work with cover cropping on the farm rather than tilling the soil, which is uh, a practice that's uh, normally used in traditional agriculture. Um, cover crops do a lot of the work for us when we use them mindfully. So they help with mining and supplying nutrients, adding organic matter, and they reduce erosion, which I think is one of the most important of their roles, since we all know soil is expensive. Cover crops also outcompete weeds, and because of that, they lessen the labor on our end, because if any of us are gardeners, we know that weeding is probably the most tedious task. Um, when crop planting on the farm, we're also looking at ways to interplant as it's a priority because it's a way that you can maximize any space available for higher yields. And depending which crops you're planting together, you can also extend their season. For example, if you're utilizing the shade that your tomato plants provide, you can extend the season of cool weather loving crops like lettuce, arugula, mustard greens. Um, and lastly, at the garden, again, we love education and we work to include it in everything that we do. At the farm, we host an internship program where interns learn about sustainable agriculture with the hopes that they'll take that knowledge back to their own communities. So the pictures below were this year's farm interns. Two of them are also muralists. I was very lucky for some reason I got a lot of artists this year. Um, so we began painting an educational mural that you see them starting there. Um, it focuses on life cycles. So it's actually progressed more after this picture was taken. So I recommend you all to take a trip down and see its progress. So the phases of the moon are gonna give credit to other branches of agriculture, such as biodynamic agriculture, which uses the phases of the moon when farming. It's also going to have native plants, crops, and the life cycle of a lot of our common pollinators like monarchs, um, our beneficial predators like ladybugs, and also uncommon pollinators like bats and hummingbirds. So at the farm, interns also supervise our weekend farm stand and open hours. The farm stand was fully on a pay what you can sliding scale and interns would harvest and give informal tours to visitors. We had produce, tea bags, um, also bouquets on a date on donation based purchasing. We also invited pantry recipients to join with free admission passes to the garden so that they could see where their food was coming from and also get to know those that were growing it. We also welcomed local artists to sell their art and handmade goods without charging a rental fee as a way to bring together more members of the community. During the week, we also host volunteer hours for members of the community to get to know us, our work, and to also learn about gardening and ways to implement it in their own given space. So pictured above is Meredith. Uh, she's holding a python snake bean um, that we measured at four feet long. So she actually started off as a high school summer intern with no previous gardening experience. And she became extremely passionate and now she's applying to the Cornell Agriculture Program. So now we'll dive into the topic of this conversation while also considering the Queen Botanical Gardens Farms mission and playing a role in this larger issue. Why is urban agriculture relevant in the topic of climate change? So looking at this closed loop, we can see how community is interconnected with the larger issue at hand. And of course, this isn't even touching the surface on how deep this can really go. So this slide pretty much says the same as the previous loop, but in a prettier way. Um, so farming in the city is something that is imperative to think about when considering how cities can adapt to climate change, 
as well as we all know it will have greater effects in lower income communities. So urban agriculture is a hot topic as it holds the promise of helping us reduce the environmental impact of our food choices and in turn can help improve the environment in our city. Um, it helps to address local food insecurity issues in cities and growing food in cities can take the form of like was previously said in backyard, rooftop, balcony gardening. Um, I love walking in New York City and looking up and seeing all the, all the fire escape gardens. I think they're really cool and people get really creative. I saw someone build a garden in cinder blocks and tires in the neighborhood in Bushwick, Brooklyn. So it's, it's very interesting what you can do and you don't need to spend a lot of money doing it. Um, it urban agriculture, because of that, it also eases the access to food. It reconnects the communities to the practice of growing the food and engages the community in a variety of levels. Um, so we will also wanna think about it as kind of intertwining the social fabric of our communities when we're exchanging knowledge on different ways of growing something that maybe you've never tried to eat before. It also creates economic opportunities for farmers, uh, urban farmers specifically and within their neighborhoods. Um, we wanna always think about the fact that the food on your plate didn't necessarily come magically packaged in plastic in a supermarket. Um, it's always produced elsewhere and it normally comes from rural areas. But we want to think about it within the, our local ecosystem and how um, it doesn't only play a role in the environment, but also our choices as consumers. Um, so people in, in cities, they generally also have limited access to nature. So especially those that live in lower income areas. All of these factors tell us that urban agriculture can play a role in, some, in solving some or part of these problems. So we'll begin with uh, thinking back at that closed loop that I showed earlier. So food security, economic opportunity and reconnection. So this topic, urban agriculture reduces the vulnerability of most urban, of most vulnerable urban groups and it strengthens the community-based adaptive management. It does this because urban farms diversify the urban food sources by enhancing access of communities to nutritious food. It reduces dependency on imported foods and it decreases the vulnerability to periods of low food supply from rural areas. When we're thinking about the pandemic and I'm sure, at least I saw it in my neighborhood, people were waiting in lines to access the food pantry when there was barely any food or food that really expensive. So we want to think about urban agriculture as a source of innovation and learning new strategies for efficient food production. Um, also, what is an urban farm? It has lots of plants and if it's done right, also has flowers. So you're also creating green space in your community. You're maintaining green open spaces and enhancing the vegetation cover in the city with important adaptive and again, if done mindfully, also mitigation. So some of these benefits are reduced heat island effects. I'm sure you notice when you walk through the park how much cooler it is than in neighborhoods where there are barely any trees. Again, those neighborhoods are usually lower income neighborhoods that don't have those trees. Um, it also, because of that, there's less smog as well. Um, it's also reduced impacts related to high rainfall. So I'm sure those of you that use social media maybe saw all those crazy videos of the high rainfall this summer and all of our subways were flooded. So if there are more trees, if there are more plants, there's higher infiltration, um, keeping flood zones free of construction as well. When we think of our airports, what are they built on? They're built on wetlands. So we wanna keep flood zones free from construction and we need to create ways that will limit the need for that. So if we have urban farms in these areas, then it's a functional zone that won't need another high rise. Um, also, there's improved water quality through the natural cleaning. So um, there's less water runoff and there's more CO2 and dust capture. And if we think about farming in the less traditional and more in the permaculture sense when you're thinking about incorporating more trees 
rather than just our traditional crops, then you're also um, creating less ability of landslide because you have those trees that are able to put down roots if you want to start urban farming on, say, a steep slope. A lot of areas in the Bronx have slopes, so you can think about the, the landscape as well when you're thinking about where to place uh, a new urban farm. So it also enhances the conservation of biodiversity by protecting a wider base of plant and animal diversity. Um, next with climate adaption, which is why we're here today. So also everything I said before, adding on to that, we also want to use kind of reusing what we already have. So safely reusing wastewater and composting organic waste. We want to reduce the competition for fresh water between agriculture, domestic and industrial uses. And in order to do that, we need to implement um, water harvesting methods. And if you're composting a lot of this waste, most of our waste comes from food waste. So you're also reducing landfill volumes and then in turn, methane emissions. So I'm always thinking about that loop again, because as you can see, you're, once you're working with one thing, it'll lead to the next thing and ongoing because it's all connected. So can urban agriculture make our cities more sustainable? I mean, based off of everything I just said, I would say probably yes. Um, urban farming helps with the environment, our social and economic challenges in a local area um, that can extend for miles. So plants can improve the Earth's climate by reducing heat during warm season, retains water, and therefore reducing the risk of floods. Um, we also want to think that we're not necessarily just sharing our space with people, um, you'll hear more about uh, our, why we need to preserve areas for pollinators um, next, but it's important to also consider all the birds that are migrating through. So you want to include that in every step of the way and how your impact will not only impact your immediate community, but also thinking about 10 years from now, who's going to use that space as well. Um, a lot of the organic waste from fresh food is produced in cities. So kind of, again, keeping everything localized and thinking local. Um, the health of, of people are also, that are involved in urban gardening also improves. So if you're around green spaces, you have cleaner air. And it's been shown that areas that have community gardens popping up that previously had high crime rates also see crime reduction because people are more involved and get to know their neighbors. They, they feel like they're working towards a very valuable mission because it is. Um, and obviously food is good for our health. So if you're growing diverse food, you're also eating a diverse diet. Um, so it's important to note that if urban agriculture has a growing recognition for a reason, because it is an important strategy for climate change adaption, um, we want to think of it as, um, as just one thing that we can all manage that will have a much greater purpose. Um, and thank you. So these are some of our interns and how we have fun harvesting as well. Thank you so much, Karen, for that for the slideshow and for sharing all of that knowledge. Um, I want to just call out quickly, I see a comment from Carolina in the chat that maybe the sound went out. I'm wondering if anyone else has lost the ability to, to hear um, the presenters. Maybe just let us know in the chat because I don't know if it's a wider issue or if it's just uh, for our speakers. Okay. So it seems like most people are saying that they can hear, maybe it was just a problem for Carolina. Um, is there still an issue on, on your end? Can you let us know? I can hear now. 
awesome. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, well, then we can move it right along. And again, thank you, Karen. We will have, I'm sure, questions for you here at the end of the call. So if you can hang out, we would appreciate it. Um, but right now, I want to pass it over to the founders of Island B Project, Stacey Vasquez and Carolina Zuniga. Um, Island B Project is a nonprofit organization with a mission to spread pollinator awareness through public programming and access to local urban apiaries with sites in Williamsburg, Woodside, Brownsville, and I believe on Governor's Island as well. We will hear all about that from our two special guests. So I will hand it over to you both and thank you again for being here. Thank, thank you, you for having us, yeah. Just wanna um, put a shout out there. I see Brendita on here. So chime in anytime, Brenda, if you are able to connect, but thank you for showing up. Brenda is our third partner who's uh, visiting her family in Colombia for the rest of the month of November. We miss her very much and wish she was here, but um, we're glad she's joining. Um, so formerly, we were on Governor's Island was our, um, our founding location, and we were there for about seven years. But we've moved on from there <clears throat> this past season, so we're no longer on the island. We had a great time being there. Uh, we met a lot of amazing people and did a lot of really cool um, work with the other projects that were on the island as well. Um, but these days we are in Williamsburg at the very tip of Domino Park. There is a farm collective that we're a part of called the River Street Farm Collective. And we are working in collaboration on that farm with Compost Power which is um, an inner city compost um, like project that has done really, really amazing work. And with Oco Farms, which is an aquaponics farm. Um, they have two locations. Our farm is the larger of their two and they have a really amazing um, like aquaponics system of farming there. They do do some in-ground planting as well, but their aquaponics system is really super cool. Um, we're always learning from the people that we work with. And one of the cool things that I learned about aquaponics just recently, I embarrassingly didn't know enough about it um, to think that everybody always discusses it as such a um, sustainable, like urban farming practice. Like you're not wasting anything. Like everything is constantly being reused. And I had thought, wow, it's, it's kind of weird because it's water and it's, that's kind of seems like in New York City, it would be kind of hard to maintain like this body of water to grow all your plants in. And unbeknownst to us, they've used the same like body of water in their farm uh, since the inception of our space uh, with the same principles being used that their other space in Bushwick that I believe they've been using the same like body of water there that hasn't been like changed out since the inception of that space too, which Carolina, they've been in Bushwick for seven years. I believe so for a very long time. Yeah. So it's cool. It's just like very, very cool that we, we get to work alongside these like genius projects and like learn these things. Um, our projects are all like beneficial to each other in that the bees that we keep there benefit the farm, the farm and everything that they're growing there is really beneficial to the pollinators that, um, that we host at our site. And we tend to honeybees uh, in all of our locations, but we do have like a pretty large focus on preserving um, habitat for native pollinators um, in making sure that we don't grow our apiaries too big so they're making too much competition for the other bees that were there before them. So we've done some pretty cool bee mapping in our locations and we get to see a really wide variety of different pollinators that are there. So it makes us really happy that our bees aren't bullying uh, the other species out, which is a huge concern um, as honeybees are really like 
busy pollinators so they can kind of take over. Um, but what we'd like to talk to you guys about today is the effect of our climate change on our bee populations and what we've seen firsthand and kind of some of the struggles that we've had in keeping our bees healthy and basically just alive um, during these times where everything like year to year is so completely different. Um, this year, we've just had a very freezing cold week, but the week before that, we had super high temperatures up in like the high 70s, almost 80. In many of the days were like 78, 79 degrees. And basically the challenges that are presented to us when this happens is this time of year, we are getting ready to kind of button our bees up for the winter. We do a few things to prepare them for how cold and you know inhospitable the climate naturally is here. Um, we give them insulation, we give them emergency food in case they run out of their food stores, um, we offer like a proper ventilation so that their, the inside of their hives don't collect condensation. And what the warm weather was creating for us was an environment of confusion for our bees. And we see it like across the board throughout all of our areas that we're in, um, they think that it's still summer. They think that they should still be working as hard as they need to be working, but they're flying out and there's nothing for them to pollinate because all of these blooms have dried up at this time when they're supposed to be shut down. So it, aside from being exhausting for them physically, which isn't good for their health, um, they start eating their winter food supply. So then when the cold snap does happen, their winter food supply is so much lower that they run the risk of starvation throughout the winter um, because they've eaten up all their food stores because they don't have anything to replace it with. So there's no pollen and no nectar being produced with no flowers. Um, that's a huge problem. Um, the second problem that we've been having is there's a um, parasitic mite called the Varroa destructor that is like the plague of our existence. It's a plague of every beekeeper's existence. And we're always trying to figure out ways to manage these pests because there's no way to get rid of them. If you have a bee colony, they have Varroa mites. So it's a parasitic mite that lives on the bees. And it would be the equivalent of you living with something this big like on your body, like draining your life force every day. So you really want to keep those um, numbers of mites down to a minimum. And all research has shown and experience has, has shown us that in hot climates, the Varroa mite populations increase. This is for a number of reasons. The first reason is that your queen who is repopulating the hive is laying in these like warmer temperatures. And the varroa mites develop in the brood, the developing uh, larva of honeybees. It's how they like reproduce these mites. So when your temperature is warmer and your queen is still laying all of these eggs, it's a greater uh, opportunity for these mites to really have like a population boost right before they're going to slow down production and go into a dormant phase, which leaves them very susceptible um, to the mites. If they're dormant, they don't have a means to um, be hygienic with each other, clean mites off of them, and these populations just kind of skyrocket and it can absolutely decimate your entire bee colony. So with the warmer temperatures lingering for that long, it's definitely a fear of ours that um, their mite loads have gotten so high that there's no like level of intervention that we can use at this point to kind of save them, which is very frustrating because we just try to like shepherd them. We just try to take care of them and, and make sure that, you know, we're being minimally invasive, but we're stepping in when we need to. So that's, those are the major problems that we're having at the moment is yeah, lack of um, forage for them because of the climate change 
as well as the reproduction of varroa mites. So just for context, I just want to, I was trying to do some quick math that let's say the varroa mite will preferably start laying inside of a drone cell, which takes 24 days for a drone to produce, which is a male bee. For worker bees, it takes 21 days from egg to larval to pupae stage. So let's just say that if a varroa mite goes in there and reproduces um, within that time frame from 21 to 24 days can leave with five to seven generations in that time. So when we're talking about the compounding of the mites that are um, going on, especially on the large hive, and if so many of them get into these cells and it's just completely overwhelming for the bees to the point that either um, if they're too weak, they will pretty much get weakened with diseases because it leaves them susceptible to diseases or they will abscond, which has been, happened a few times. We will just show up and the bees are just not there. Um, and they do that instinctually to pretty much save any other neighboring colonies. So I think that's really fascinating as well. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty interesting that if they are infested to a point that it's the point of no return. Absconding with a bee colony is when they all just, they leave. They just completely disappear, which is one of the factors of colony collapse disorder when you're working with bees and you go to your hive and your bees have either all died or they're just completely gone. You go through these steps of autopsying what could have possibly happened. So when you see an absconsion, which is really bizarre because the hive's just empty. I mean, they leave everything behind. They leave all their honey supply behind. They leave unborn brood behind. They just take off into the cold and like sacrifice themselves. It's really, really wild and uh, tragic and, and beautiful at the same time. But we, we have seen it. We've seen uh, the results of that just this past weekend. We had a location that due to the extended warm weather, Varroa mite loads had gotten so high that they just all decided to take off. So um, in regards to the changing weather and what we can do or what people can do in order to help your pollinators survive, really our main like ask from most people is just plant things. Plant things that bloom early in the season, plant things that bloom late in the season, um, particularly in fall, things that will stay blooming for a really, really long time. Um, you can plant goldenrod and echinacea and cosmos and things that are going to sustain them during that period while they're building up their winter food supply um, and have them blooming for longer periods because I don't really see this that trend in the weather changing. I have seen every year, I feel like our summer gets a little bit longer. And then we have no fall and we go straight into winter which is pretty drastic for them. Um, so yeah, we just ask people to plant things in every available space. Uh, and so some of the workshops that we do with children when we visit schools is we make seed bombs with them. We teach them to just throw seeds places. If you have abandoned lots in your neighborhood, your tree pits, like everywhere, we just really encourage people uh, to plant things that bloom continually throughout the season, have multiple bloom cycles. Like we're big fans of putting clover everywhere. Would rather see a giant clover lawn in anybody's house than like a grass lawn. You can mow it, it'll continually blow up, grow and bloom. You can um, improve your soil with it. So we just talk to kids about like providing forage for bees. So that's like our biggest ask. So all you gardeners and, and farmers, please focus on fall and early spring and we'll all be very happy 
and make life a lot easier, make our jobs a lot easier, make life for the bees a lot easier. Thank you both so much. I want to open it up now for questions from the group. If you are joining us by Zoom, then of course you can put your question directly in the uh, Zoom chat. If you are in person, then I imagine that maybe Paul can still type the question into to Zoom chat. Um, either way, I'm expecting questions to come through via Zoom chat. So go ahead and, and comment. Um, I wanted to start however with a question that just came to my mind um oh and i see the comment that deepa is actually getting questions by text message so great hold on to those for one moment i wanted to ask just kind of um i was just having this thought when you had mentioned stacy about planting clover is there any partnership or could there be a partnership between you all and the parks department to toss clover seeds into all of the street tree beds across New York City? That would be amazing. That would yeah. be a, a <laughs> wonderful partnership and definitely something we'd be uh, interested in seeing happen. Um, particularly because there are a lot of like invasives that grow in areas that don't really produce anything productive for pollinators. Um, our site in Woodside is very, very pretty. It's a historic cemetery and community garden that used to be an abandoned lot. So when it was an abandoned lot, it was overgrown grown with a Japanese knotweed and they've had a really tough time like kind of keeping that down but I know that clover is very strong and it like chokes everything out around it pretty much, you know, or contributes to making the soil better. So it'll get rid of a lot of the things that you don't want. So that would be an amazing partnership for them. Just have buckets of clover and just throwing it into abandoned lots and tree pits would be really great. It also grows everywhere that like you wouldn't expect it grows in really compacted soil. It grows on our farm in, um, in uh, Williamsburg that for the most part is mostly mulch, but we just humor ourselves and throw it everywhere. And we have these adorable little clover patches that pop up like in the mulch, it just takes everywhere. And it's an amazing plant, it improves your soil. And it helps so, yes, erosion, yeah. especially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These heavy rainfalls this summer was really, like you would see rivers, like small rivers form at the River Street location, River Street. Um, so it does help to have more plants, uh, especially clover, it's so fast. And we always find a ton of bees on them as well. Mm -hmm. And I wonder the Parks Department, I believe, I'm not sure who, but there was a big bulb project, like so certain areas or they received like bags of bulbs of either daffodils or tulips. Correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody knows anything, but maybe that's someone to connect to, to put in their um, big piles of seeds to be sent out. Yeah, I love that. And I thought of that because I've done street tree care. And if you partner Ooh. with the parks department, they will bring mulch to you. Um, and I remember on one occasion, there was a woman who had her own clover that she was throwing <laughs> into the mulch. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that sounds like a, a really beneficial partnership yeah, opportunity. Sure. Yeah. Um, I the project. I wanted to, so I see that Claire has a hand up. I also just want to ask quickly um, to Deepa, how many questions do you have, if you have any, just to know how to account for time? Yeah, I have about six or seven questions here. Oh, wow. Okay, so why don't we let Claire ask um, a question first, and thank you. Nice to see your face with the camera on. Hi, Claire. And then we'll pass it over to um, Deepa. And you're on mute, Claire. So go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, lovely. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Claire. I'm actually new to 
um, the New York chapter. So really excited to, to join you guys. I just wanted to jump in with that last comment because I'm new to the parks department. I actually did help with unloading those tulips that you guys were just referring to. Oh, nice. And I, <laughs> so I wanted to kind of um, maybe try to see about how that, that can move forward. Maybe not in this meeting, but follow up afterwards if it's easier to do it that way. Um, but I did just want to jump in because I'm doing a, a kind of new thing where they're doing a partnership between the Greenbelt Native Plant Center and um, the New York City um, Parks Stewardship Program. And um, it, from what I can see, it's not a thing where they've been throwing seeds um, into the lots in like a seed bomb way, but they'll grow it at the nursery and then they'll they'll spread them and, and um, put in these plugs that way. Um, but this is in Staten Island, right? Yes, yes. Still have to go there. <laughs> we do a lot too. of different volunteer days, so I can also share um, information yes, for please. Greenbelt as well if anyone's interested. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of open up that, that way and, and, and be a kind of resource and see if, you know, we could somehow make something work in the future because I think it would be really beneficial to, to kind of merge and uh, see about an alliance uh, moving forward. Right on. That would be Thanks. amazing. Yeah, thank you. Love that. Great. We're making a lot of progress tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Uh, okay. I want to, let's see if maybe we take a question or two that you have, Deepa, and then we can throw it back over to Julie, who also threw a hand up. Sure. So um, first question is for Karen. Um, do you know how the New York City composting program is going in Queens? And are there any learnings for other boroughs? And are you involved in education regarding composting? So the compost project that's here, they mostly work with residential waste. Um, so they've actually gotten a lot of calls from, transferred from 311 about the brown system, the brown bin system that's being uh, implemented in the city. Because um, now you can request from the Department of Sanitation to get a brown bin so that you can drop off your food waste much easier rather than taking it somewhere else. Um, I, seeing it from experience just in my neighborhood, it is definitely problematic just because there doesn't seem to be much education from the Department of Sanitation on how people should be putting out those bins because I think the rat problem because of that is actually getting worse in the city because um, people are not, you're supposed to put the bag in the brown bin when put the brown bin outside rather than taking it out of the brown bin and putting it outside. So what people are, it seems that they're doing is literally just putting out bags of food on the curb, which is then feeding all the rats. So um, I think there's a lot of miscommunication there I personally do not do education with compost. Um, that's a separate department here at the garden. But if you go on the Queens Botanical Garden website, there are educational opportunities with that department. So hopefully that answered that question. <laughs> yeah, I actually am in Queens and a lot of my neighbors have had questions about the proper way to put out their, their food scraps. There's a lot of confusion. So yeah, I agree that education has has been lacking. I also heard that that um, the curbside composting is going to be suspended during the winter months because of road zone. The department has limited um, capacity to pick up the food scraps while they're doing road salting and plowing for the snow. Yes, I have also seen signs about that. So I'm just curious how well that's getting out. And I wonder if people are still going to just keep putting their food out because they're, they think that they, it will get picked up. So I just, yeah, there seems to be a lot of disconnect there. Unfortunately, 311 does transfer a lot of those calls to the compost department here. And they're just like, we can't do anything about that because they just work with local residential houses rather than, um, a larger scale operation. Hopefully this will be a learning experience before they roll it out to other boroughs. Um, okay, so um, I'll go ahead and ask another question. Um, is there an inventory of land in the city that could be utilized for urban agriculture? And if so, is there an estimate of how much 
of the demand for vegetables could be met by urban agriculture in New York City? That is a great question. Um, sadly, the answer is that the information there is very sparse. Um, the reason for that is that a lot of plots that kind of look abandoned are actually owned by someone. Um, so a lot of times abandoned land is privatized. So there isn't much of a resource for people to go out there and, and say, hey, I want to start a community garden. You have to jump through a lot of hoops. Um, but I don't have much more in-depth information on that. I don't know if anyone else does, but that's information I've also looked into. Well, Leah, did okay. you want to? Yeah, let's turn it over to Julie. And I think that, you know, going forward, if anyone else wants to raise their hand and just ask their question, you know, unmute themselves, you could definitely do that. That seems to be a good way of, of engaging. So Julie, over to you. I, I had several comments and a question. The first one was a follow-up to my chat. So if there were too many mites, what happens to the bees? They just leave and they die? Yes. That was the first, wow, that's sad. Now, the second question, more of a comment for both of you. Um, the first comment is that um, I've done, well, I edited a paper on human elephant conflict in Thailand. And I know that bees are used to uh, mitigate, you know, crop um, deforestation by elephants. So, like the elephants, they don't raid the crops if you put a beehive fence. And it's really more of a comment. Um, I don't know if we use bees for anything like that here. It was really interesting. Actually, the Queen's Zoo and actually has a beehive fence in it. They're actually um, making honey, but I mean they're not just they're not just using it in Thailand. They're using it in you know uh, South Africa and blah blah blah. But it, I, I just wondered that that was my first comment. And my second comment um, was with reference to the Botanic Garden that um, myself, my mother and my children did the Brooklyn, well, I did the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, my children did it, and my mother did the one in the Bronx. And I wondered if you had like a similar children's garden in, in Queens. And cause I know they're like in, in Brooklyn, they like the kids do farming, but not some of the regenerative stuff that you were talking about. So anyway, those are comments and questions. And I think was the question about whether or not bees are utilized in the city to prevent- For some kind of mitigation purpose, you know? Well- Not elephants, obviously, yeah. but some yeah. other, some other, you know, have we, have we progressed to that idea? Would there be a need for that mm -hmm. here, you know? Well, I don't it, know. It's very interesting. Um, they do that in Africa on elephant preserves. The, Bees yeah. in, the bees in Africa are absolutely incredible. They are formidable and Correct. very strong. They are resistant to varroa mites like no other species of honeybee. They're really incredible. And the way that they see, this is how it works with the elephant fences. The way that they see, because the elephant skin is very tough and to keep them inside of a perimeter is like very right. difficult. The way that they see, they can see the heat centers on an elephant's body. So when the elephants get too close to the hives, they're very defensive bees and they will come out with the entirety of their colony and they will sting them in their eyes and their genitals. And then once that happens to an elephant, they're very smart. So they look at the area and they say, I'm not going over there. And they just don't. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. Um, I don't know in New York City where uh, bee fence would kind of be a, applicable, maybe, um, I don't know, we've worked with chickens before and I don't, the chickens kind of mind their, you know, they, they know where their food is, so it's fine, but I'm, I'm not sure where it would be applicable. I think it, it's, it would be really kind of difficult to have a program like that, as cool as it is, as like a bee person. I'm like, yes, yeah, put them everywhere. Let's. It, Let's use them to help. But honestly, um, a lot of the work that we do with people is getting them to understand bee behavior and not be afraid of them. 
So I don't know that B fences would, <laughs> would, would really Are you help. familiar with the work of Lucy King? No. Um, I worked with Antoinette Van der Water, but I just, when you see, you know a lot about it. That's why I asked you that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so in Thank other words, you. what happens, what happens oh. with the mites is that the mites, like they, the, 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 the mites can like, they, the mites are poisonous to them? What is it exactly about the mites? They like drain their life force. And on top of that, they um, pass a virus along to them that doesn't affect the colony as it stands, but the incoming babies that are born come out with deformed wings. And wow. it's, it's called deformed wing virus. And they, um, when you when you see a colony with brand new babies, which we know what they look like because they're very like fluffy and fuzzy and brand new and like very cute, it when their wings are like mangled, it's horrible to see. Like you know that your colony is pretty infested. We do tests with the bees. Like when we visit them, we test them to see what their mite loads are, so we know we can kind of figure out how to intervene if we need to, and we for the most part intervene a few times a year just to keep those numbers low because once you see deformed wing virus um in your brood that's coming out it's like pretty much too late to do anything about it it's 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 pretty bad they have um serious negative effects on bee colonies in multiple different ways um if the your colony isn't large enough the mites will just take over and like decimate them and they'll like succumb before absconding. But if they're strong and they have a high mite load, they will leave. Like for the greater good of colonies everywhere. It's like an internal thing that they do. It's very poetic and, and sad, but they just fly out and give themselves up. So Where do they go? Very smart. They just go, they go and I, I'm, I'm interested to see if there is any footage of on record of an absconsion, like in, in progress. We have a lot of video of swarm behavior in progress, but you don't really get to see absconsions like live like that. So we're not sure if they just all go out in different directions, if they all go into a clump somewhere and just succumb to the cold. But the general idea is that they give themselves up for the greater good of of other bee colonies. Thank you. I wanna, just to account for time, we have three more minutes left. So I wanna take another question or maybe two from the ones that Deepa had, if you wanna go ahead and ask and see if we can wrap this up. Sure. Um, so this is from the, the Society for Ethical Culture Room question. Um, first of all, everybody loves um, Stacy's earrings. Um, and <laughs> Question. Thank you. <laughs> um, if you have a backyard garden or somewhere to plant um, flowers and other other plants, um, is there anything that could be planted to attract bees and other pollinators? Or do you have a website uh, recommendation for the, uh, plant recommendations? The Xerxes Society has an amazing like database and you can plug it in per region. So if your aunt in Ann Arbor, Michigan wants to know what she should be planting, like they'll tell you regionally, like what's good. And it's such an amazing resource. It tells you which of these um, flowering plants has like a high pollen count, has a high nectar count, which ones are best. And it's like a rating system. So you know, when you look at it, what are the best things that you could plant that will produce the right amount of forage for them. So it's, it's really cool. So it's a Xerxes society with a Z. Um, and we use it like to pick things that we're planting. On our farm um, in, in Williamsburg, we see uh, they love oregano. Love. So they go absolutely bonkers for it. So like you have an oregano bush and we've seen like six different species of pollinators like on them. And they're just going crazy. They love it. So it's, it's cute to see a lot I of fl add, flowering herbs. The Xerces, so it's X-E-R-C-E-S dot org. Thanks, Caroline. 
Um, I'm also going to post in the chat uh, a link to this one pager document about the Island B project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Um, do we have time for one more question, Malia? Um, I would say, you know, we're at time. So if anyone absolutely has to leave, then we understand and you're free to do so. But if you're willing to stay for another couple of minutes, um, I say we take another question uh, from Deepa. Okay. This That's one okay. Is for Karen. Um, so the question is regarding um, multi story warehouse hydroponic farming. Um, so the question is regarding kind of the, the, the growth of this kind of farming in cities, in New York City and elsewhere. And do you see any advantages or disadvantages to this style of energy intensive agriculture? Um, so I would say that's more of an opinion question. So I would think there are many disadvantages. The reason for that is, again, because it's high energy. Also, a lot of times the input of the fertilizer, it's a lot of synthetic fertilizer. Only recently they've started um, getting, instead of synthetic, using like composting pellets to fertilize those systems. But still, it's more, to do it on a mass scale is a bit problematic. But like everything, it's important to start somewhere because only then can you advance with the technology to be able to sustain it without heavy energy. So, you know, everything always has to start somewhere and it's a great educational tool to be able to grow your food in schools, in the cafeteria, if you don't have space, have space for a school garden. Um, everything has its place. And I think, yeah, it definitely is problematic from an environmental standpoint, but it also, if you're trying to grow more, more food, sometimes that is the way to do it. Okay, and Deepa, I think you had one additional question. Didn't you have like five or six? I think some of them uh, were answered in the course of conversation. So I don't really have any okay. more questions here. Okay, and I saw um, Brendita has put a hand up, so. We're happy to welcome you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Brenda. <laughs> I, Hi. I, I, I just wanted to add a little, this is awesome. I'm, I'm so sad that I couldn't fully participate, but I'm in a different country, so it's real choppy. Um, I just got into a place with a lot of Wi-Fi, so I figured I'd just throw in a little comment. Um, if uh, anyone ever wants to help immediately for the bees, they can also put out water because our girls get really thirsty too, and people don't really think about them actually drinking water. Um, but in the summer, they don't have a lot of sources, especially in the city. They have to kind of go out really far in their flights to find that water. So if you just put a little bowl out with some mud, some soil, and just regular water, they're going to come right to it, take a little sip, and then go off on their way. So they do like dirty water, aka mud water, um, so just if you put plain water, they might just be like, nah, but if you throw a little bit of mud in it, um, the minerals, the, the salts will definitely help them along their way. So quick little way to just throw them some love. That's all. Yeah. Thank you for joining and thank you for adding that. So we know we can put out water, we can plant things. Those will be our contributions to the bees going forward. Um, but with that said, so we're just a little bit over time. I think we've gotten through all of the questions and just wanna wrap this up by saying thank you again to our speakers. Um, I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody here learned a lot and we could probably you know, keep this conversation going if we had more time, um, but Thank you again. I wish everyone a great holiday week and I'll see you next time. Thanks again. Thank you for having us. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Bye everyone. Have Bye. a nice night.